Hey guys, it's Dean. Welcome to the Better Man Podcast. Today I am joined by Zach Long. He is a PT, DPT SCS, which basically means he's a physical therapist with a lot of qualifications. We'll talk about that in a second. He has uh, an incredibly popular social media channel. He has um, a lot of experience in a clinical setting. He has a website and app called Performance Plus, and he is an extremely knowledgeable guy. I'm super excited to have him on the podcast today. So Zach, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Excited to chat. Yes. All right. So first off, uh, I'll say that my wife is a big fan of yours um, and all of her PT friends. My wife is a physical therapist. She also has a, she's a DPT. She has her OCS. You have your SCS. So yeah. little different. Um, but anyways, they they all know you. So this is pretty cool for me. Um, can you first off just tell, tell me what, um, what does DPT SCS mean? DPT stands for doctor in physical therapy. Um, mm -hmm. Then SCS stands for sports certified specialist or what your wife has, the orthopedic certified specialist. That's just in the medical world. So like you go and see your, a doctor, an MD, you would see an orthopedist. They've not only graduated from medical school, but they've gone and done extra training in the orthopedic realm. That's kind of their distinction of why they have the specific name that they have. For physical therapists, we just have to get our degree and pass our licensure exam. And then you can practice in any setting with that, but you'll see a small proportion of physical therapists do more training and study for a test that gives them that distinction of SCS or OCS, or there are, there are a few others that are mm -hmm. out there that just signals that that person's done a little bit of extra training in this setting. Cool. Got it. Um, so what are, what are some misconceptions about, you know, being a DPT? What are, you know, what knowledge does a DPT have that people might not realize? So a uh, physical therapy degree is just a, a very general degree in terms of understanding the human body and a little bit of movement science, but it's preparing you to pass a test that then lets you practice in a wide variety of settings. So there's going to be physical therapists that work in more athletic populations like I do. There's physical mm -hmm. therapists that work more general population with orthopedic injuries, which is based on what we talked about off air, probably a little bit more of what your wife does. But there's mm -hmm. also physical therapists that work in like skilled nursing facilities, acute care, hospitals, long-term care facilities, helping people with things as far away from what like you, your wife does and I do as spinal cord and stroke rehabilitation. So it's really a mm -hmm. wide ranging profession. And so, you know, if somebody's dealing with something and they're looking to see a physical therapist, that's where they probably really want to dial into finding a physical therapist that actually knows the thing that they struggle with to mm -hmm. help them out rather than seeing somebody that's just a, a generalist. Got it. And so what, what are some common reasons why people would want to go see a physical therapist versus, you know, if they, let's say they get injured, they have a, let's say they tear their hamstring, like a some really common injury or something like that, or they have some, some unfamiliar, undiagnosed pain, what are some reasons that they would want to go see a physical therapist versus going straight to an orthopedist or seeking out, you know, help from, I don't know, somebody less qualified, like a, or less educated, less educated, like a, like a personal trainer or something. So I'd say the distinction between the personal trainer and the medical world, whether that's a physical therapist and orthopedist, et cetera, is when it comes to pain. So, you know, anybody in the medical world, physical therapist, chiropractor, MD, et cetera, et cetera, have been trained in how we go about screening in or out different diagnoses. So we can talk about, all right, is this pain running down the back of your leg? Is that actual like a hamstring strain or hamstring tear? Is that referred pain from your back? Is that referred pain from the hip joint or the muscles around the hip? And our role is to screen those out and try to actually identify what are the specific tissues or areas that are generating those symptoms. And that's where you want to see a medical person versus a personal trainer that's going to be more focused on somebody that is generally in okay shape from a health perspective. I mean, maybe they have cardiovascular disease or other things like that, but like we're not dealing with like an orthopedic injury that they're trying to diagnose and figure out how to work around. They're focused on building up somebody's overall fitness. So then, you know, in terms of where you go from a physical therapist to an orthopedist, I really look at the medical world as like, this is whatever license you have. That is your license to practice, at least within the scope that the laws in your state allow you to practice. So when people ask me, should I see a PT or a chiropractor? Well, that doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. 
because I know some physical therapists that are great clinicians at screening in or out different things and progressively loading people up to get them back to the activities they, that they love. There are also ones out there that are not very good at that. Same thing in the chiropractic world. So for me, it's more about less about the letters behind their name, more about what they actually do with the person in front of them. Got it. So, so I didn't what are the question that much, did I? No, that's okay. That's helpful. Um, so that kind of leads me to my another my other question, which is how can you tell if you've got a good physical therapist? What are some things that you should look look for? You know, um, what are some practical general guidelines they should follow and maybe what are some red flags? I'd say one of the biggest things to look for to know if somebody's a really good physical therapist, and that would also be a red flag that you're not seeing a really good therapist, is how accurately they are tracking your symptoms. So mm. let's say you go to your doctor and you're having issues with your blood pressure. Every time you go and see your doctor, the first thing that they do is they measure your blood pressure because they can accurately, reliably test that between sessions. And now they know if the medicine that they're giving you and the dose of that medicine they're giving you is having the desired effect. Well, we need to do the same in rehabilitation of injuries. So when somebody comes to see me, let's use your hamstring strain, for example, I want to know, all right. Last time you told me that when you were doing leg curls with 75 pounds, that that created a four out of 10 pain, that when you were done with your workout, that pain lasted for four hours afterwards. Now we've got something measurable, observable, repeatable, mm -hmm. that week by week, we should see changes in that. And I really think that we have to be like that dialed in. So we want to, in, in general, the, the way I practice and the way we teach in the company that I teach courses for is that we want to have two subjective asterisk signs and two objective asterisk signs subjective meaning like things you're coming in and telling me that we can measure i can run a mile before my pain gets greater than a three out of ten hmm. objective being if it was a hamstring strain like if you have your legs straight and you bend forward and reach towards your toes to stretch your hamstrings if you have a hamstring strain at a certain point stretching your hamstrings will probably irritate it a little bit well i'm going to measure how far down you can bend before that becomes irritated and maybe one other objective asterisk sign. And now I have four different things that I'm testing every single time I see a patient so that there is absolutely no guesswork if what we're doing is working or not. If it's not working, mm -hmm. we got to change directions. If it is working, we got to figure out, do we have the dose right? Or can we up that dose a little bit more? Just like with your fitness, like you're not going to go to the gym every week trying to improve your, let's say you're trying to improve your max back squat. You're looking mm -hmm. at your log book week by week. You're making sure you put a little bit more weight on the bar. Mm -hmm. You did a few more reps, whatever it is, you're, objectively tracking what you're doing, we need to do the same in rehab. So that's probably my biggest red flag that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. um, the second yeah. thing that to me is a giant red flag um, with people is when they're just told to rest versus being given lots of modifications mm -hmm. for what they're doing. So, you know, if somebody has a hamstring strain, there's so many different exercises and adjustments that we can make to try to maintain as much fitness as possible. You've worked mm -hmm. really hard for your fitness. Let's not take a month off from doing everything and not only deal with that hamstring being damaged, weaker, broken down, but now because we're not training lower body at all, our calves are getting weaker. Our hips are getting weaker. Our quads are getting weaker. We're losing all this other area of fitness. And now that hamstring strain calms down, we pop back into doing what we were doing. And now those weakened glutes become an issue where your back mm -hmm. starts to bother you, your knee starts to bother you. So uh, the second big flag to me is, do they have the skills to really help you modify what you're doing to keep you doing some version of the things that you love and want to be doing or need to be doing? Mm. So that, that brings me that that reminds me of this, um, this new acronym, you know, I think a lot of people are stuck in the, the 1980s when it comes yeah. to rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And rice is yeah. right, like R I C E. That's like the that is like, what people think, mm -hmm. what people think is the gold standard. And there's actually a new one now called Have you heard of peace and love? I don't I'm think sure I've you peace have. And love. Okay, it's like it's called peace and love. I, I'm I'm pretty I sure think... it's peace and love. Maybe I'm maybe I'm messing that up. Um, yeah, it's it's called peace and love. It's it was developed by um, it was developed by I don't know if it was physical therapists in Britain, but it was a British development of some sort, and it's a different acronym on how people should be addressing injuries now because mm -hmm. we know that if you avoid an in, if you avoid you know, addressing an injury and you just let it rest that there's no circulation going there. There's no yeah. sort of recovery happening. And especially with things like back pain, back pain doesn't yeah. get better unless you're actually doing exercises. Right. So like, you know, I get a lot of people who message me, they're like, oh, I've got some back pain. So I'm just going to wait till it goes away. And I'm kind of like, no, no, no. That's like, that's why you do it. Yeah, That's why you do the exercises. 
so many times <laughs> that exercising with back pain is like, is the thing that you have to do. Yeah. It's, it's one thing that everybody agrees on is when you have back pain, you exercise. And I love the word you use there, circulation. Like when you mm. have an injury, an acute injury, not chronic stuff, that's, that's a different ballpark. But when you have an acute injury, you have tissues that have been damaged and broken down. And you also have an inflammatory response that happens from it. That inflammatory mm -hmm. response is good, but some of those inflammatory chemicals will keep things a little bit more irritated and painful than they actually are from a damage standpoint. And so pumping blood into an area, moving mm -hmm. fluids in and out of an area so often helps with people's pain, not just from like a general whole body, like endorphin relief release when you exercise, but actual down to those tissues, pumping some of that inflammation out is, is a huge part of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So like how, what, what's, would you say that? Would you say that rice is outdated or what aspects of it yeah, do you think people out, should? Rice is outdated. Okay. So what, what about it? Like, what about it should people totally, you know, not follow? The rest. So we want to be doing the some rest. Of I mean, even if somebody's okay. coming to me with like highly irritable back pain, we can do something like get on an exercise bike or an echo bike is, is probably mm -hmm. my favorite. So an echo bike or a swin airdyne bike, which more people are probably familiar with that. You have a pedal as well as arm pumps. And so your back's not even really doing anything, but your legs moving gets blood mm -hmm. pumping from your heart all the way down to the lower body. Your arms moving back and forth, you know, gets everything pumping in your arms. You're just going to get your heart rate jacked up and you're going to work the biggest mover of fluids in your body being your heart. And so, I mean, even if it's, we have to scale stuff down to just that, mm -hmm. I want people doing some form of movement. Um, mm -hmm. You'll hear a lot of debate right now on the ice component of rice. Where a lot yeah. of people are saying, like, I think even the doctor that originally came up with the, the rice acronym, like, yeah. he's come out and said he no longer believes in ice. Um, yeah, his name is Gary Gary something. I have his I have his book. It's called like yeah, it, it, exactly. It's that's exactly it. He came out and said like this is not valid anymore because rice restricts because ice restricts, restricts um, circulation. Yeah. yeah, and that's exactly what you need to recover. So okay. should people use ice at all? I think there are times to use it and times to not. I think that's I think that's one of the more minor details in terms of rehab, whether it's mm. going to go as fast as possible or slow as possible. I could be wrong yeah. about this. I'm telling you, this is more my opinion, not not science based. But um, look, if you're really really irritated and you need to ice something down to numb it for a period of time, mm -hmm. please numb it and, rather than going and getting on like a, a pill that we all know that that getting on mm. you know a, a big time pain reliever medication that's not going to be good for you long term i'd rather you ice than do that okay if something is actively like super swelling up like you sprain your ankle right now do i want you to ice it to try to reduce a little bit of that swelling so that we can get you moving a little bit faster tomorrow absolutely mm -hmm. do i want you icing something you know three weeks after an initial injury at that point i don't think it's probably the best thing for you i want you moving and pumping fluids a little bit more mm -hmm. um so to recap it's not, it's... A, it's not as it's a and not or thing Okay. So it's good for when the initial, when the injury injury initially happens. And if you need temporary pain reduction, need temporary but pain reduction and something's like actively really swelling, then utilize it. Other than that, I, I don't think it has a big effect, positive, maybe a minor effect or negative. All right, guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode really quick here. I just want to mention something. If you've done any of my workouts or followed along to my videos, you're probably going to recognize the apparel that I'm wearing in them. It's a company called Roan. They are premium men's active wear. I've been using them for the last five or six years. Again, you're going to see them in pretty much all of my workout videos that I've recorded. They are incredibly high quality, long lasting apparel. Some of those things I've had for the last five years, and they're still being rotated through my closet. Their founder, uh, Nate Checkets, we had here on the Better Man podcast, and we talked about how we can be better men, um, both for ourselves and also ex as examples to our sons. And uh, I'm just a big fan of what Roan is doing. I love their product. I love their mission. I love their vision. And uh, I hope you can support them. We do have a 20% savings code that you can use. Just click the link in the description of the show notes here, and the 20% will automatically be added to your purchase on Roan.com. Thanks for listening. Let's get back into the episode. Okay. So I'm going to ask you this because I, I personally do this. So I'm into, I, I got on the ice bath train, you know, probably a few years ago. I had a, I had a chest freezer that I found on Craigslist, filled it with water and like swapped out the water every couple of weeks when it started to get too smelly. And, uh, and now I actually have like a, you know, one of the cool cold plunges, like a standalone unit with a built-in filtration keeps the water cold. Um, how can that be helpful with, uh, recovery versus, you know, I mean, most, 
from what I understand, most professional athletes use it, especially yeah. soccer players, football players, bas- I mean, basketball players, people who have a lot of pound and ground, a lot of stress on the joints. But at what extent does that become, at what extent that does that kind of hinder the hinder, hinder circulation and the muscle growth process? Or is there data on that? I've done the deepest dive into the research. So I'm going to tell you the couple of things that I know on it that I think are worth people considering if they do that. Mm-hmm. Um, number one, what do I think probably the biggest benefit of it is, is probably the, like the psychological point. Mm-hmm. In general, if you're listening to this podcast, you're living a pretty easy life compared to what people were living a hundred years ago or more. And there's something to be said about us challenging our body and our psyche on a regular basis. I think that's one of the big reasons why it's really important for people to exercise really hard or to put themselves through physical challenges, such as an ice bath. I think an ice bath is also going to, from a meditation standpoint, like I'm Mm. not somebody that you will ever get to stop and meditate. It's it's just not who I am. But I think you could get me to challenge (laughs) myself to get into, (laughs) this is the wrong podcast to say that out of that. Um, Yeah. You could get me to jump into an ice bath and just be solely focused on that and thinking yeah. about that and working through it. I think it's a form of meditation, form mm-hmm. of down regulation for some people. Totally. On the negative side, there is research that shows that icing will have a inhibition effect on, on muscle hypertrophy. So if your goal is muscle hypertrophy, then you might want to look into what some people say in terms of when to ice bath around your training so that you don't blunt the inflammation response that happens after training that is a positive inflammation response that mm-hmm. would then result in you having less potential hypertrophy if that is your your goal. There's also the same research in terms of taking um, um, insects, mm-hmm. like ibuprofen around your workouts. People that take ibuprofen regularly see less hypertrophy because it blunts the inflammation response that's necessary for that process to happen. So that's okay. the extent of what I know about it. That's good to know. Um, all right. So for me, that means uh, I need to stop jumping in the ice bath after my workouts, but I can do them after like a walk. My gut would say that like if you wake up in the morning and you do that and then you work out a couple hours later, that it's probably going to have a negligible effect on anything at all. Mm. Okay. In terms cool. of the hypertrophy response, but I think it probably is really valuable again from the, the mental side. Got it. Yeah. I, uh, I can attest definitely it's like the, uh, the mental benefit of it, of getting in, challenging yourself, and also being able to carry that over to other things mm-hmm. like 10 breaths. 10 breaths in an ice bath and then going to like 10 breaths of pigeon. I'm like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> this is manageable now. Um, yeah. So I have a question, another question about, uh, people going to see orthopedist, like an orthopedist or a doctor, um, who, especially one who's knife happy, um, versus going to a physical therapist and, you know, focusing on the proper exercises instead of seeking out surgical inter- intervention. What are your thoughts on that? So I'm going to be biased just like an orthopedic surgeon is going to be biased. And my, my mm-hmm. bias as a physical therapist is what I do, like the worst effect of you seeing me for six weeks is that I delay you getting some sort of surgical intervention mm-hmm. a little bit, which in general, when you look at most surgeries, not all, but most surgeries, like delaying them a little bit doesn't significantly change your long-term outcomes. Mm-hmm. But once you've been cut into, we can't uncut you. Right. So, you know, if something goes bad in surgery, then we are stuck with that. So mm-hmm. I would much rather in general, for the vast majority of things, have people start with, with, a you know, six weeks of conservative care with somebody that's doing a great job of tracking your symptoms, like we discussed earlier. And if we're seeing some good improvements in that, and that a lot of times won't be that you're completely pain-free, but if we have these objective markers saying that, Hey, things are really improving, then let's look at continuing that because so many different surgeries lately have been challenged quite a bit in the research. Like yeah. there's been some, some placebo surgery research done lately where yeah. they put people to sleep. Half of them, they actually do a surgery on half of them. They're sitting there in the, the room and the doctors are saying, all right, give me the scalpel. And they say making the incision, but they're not <laughs> even doing it. And they're clanging tools together. They're literally pretending like they're doing the surgery. They wake people up. They put them all through a, plan a post-op rehab and a number of these studies have shown that we kind of see the same outcomes. So I'm, but don't mishear me. I'm not saying that all orthopedic surgeries are worthless. I'm just saying that I really think that those things should make us stop and think, do we have to go surgery first or can we try more conservative things prior to? Yeah. Like that's, that's an important question for me. I had, um, I had 
knee surgery when I was 16, I had a, uh, I think I had my MCL laterally released. Mm -hmm. So I lengthened my tendon in an, or I shortened my tendon, uh, in an attempt to make it more, uh, in an attempt to make it pop in an attempt to keep my kneecap where it was supposed to be. I shortened that tendon. So I'm just saying that, um, and I had to, I was, I had to go back and ask, like, even like a few years ago, I'm like, what, what happened? Like, what did I get new surgery for? Which, which kind of goes, which is kind of reflective of this idea of like people get surgery and they don't really know what it's for. And I was 16, you know, I was in really good shape. And looking back, if I had had the proper education for someone to come out and say like, Hey, yeah, you have a knee injury, but also your hip mobility is garbage and you have no ankle mobility and you're yeah. playing sports like three hours a day and you have all these imbalances that you don't know about. And if you just worked on those and did the appropriate exercises, worked on your strength training, you know, maybe weren't such a, a such a bro science person in the weightlifting room, then you would learn like, oh, squats are, you know, you know, back squats are good for me, even though I'm not a lineman. Because I thought like when I was 17, even 18, if someone was like, Aren't you going to do back squats? I was like, nah, I'm not a lineman. I don't do this. I don't do any, like, I don't do lower body exercises. <laughs> I just do core and like pull-ups and stuff. Um, and I do deadlifts, but I only use my lower back instead of my, my hamstrings and glutes. So I think I just had this really, you know, weak understanding of, uh, of physical fitness in general and, and not really understanding why I was getting surgery. And I'm leading this into a question, which is, do you think that people are getting less surgery now than they were 20 years ago? I don't think the research would support that. I think, okay. I think we're probably still seeing more than we were then. Wow. Okay. Um, I cannot confirm that with data outside of the hip. Probably the thing I treat more than anything is um, hip impingement mm -hmm. in fitness athletes. And um, at least in that area, the surgeries are through the roof. So there's tons wow. more of like hip labrum um, repairs being done, tons more um, things where they basically shave the ball and socket of your hip. That surgery mm. is oh God, probably like tenfold what it was 15 years ago. I wow. can't comment on other areas. So that, that actually leads me to, uh, uh, a big question of mine, which is what are some of the really common, what are some of the most common preventable injuries, um, that you see, particularly in the, in the 40 plus male population, um, and can those be prevented with the right exercises or are some of them, you know, are they, do they get, do they require surgery? Would they have required surgery no matter what, or have they just gotten to the extent that they now require surgery because there was no proper intervention prior? All right. A lot of pieces of that. So I know. So first question, com common preventable injuries in the, in the plus 40 population. So I'd say in general, when you look at most research studies that look at where injuries happen in so many different populations of recreational fitness athletes, most of the time it says that shoulder is the number one injured area in the body, number two back, and then number three is typically like the knee and hip. So I'd say that, you know, I mostly, I see more hips than anything else, but shoulders and back are, are number one and two almost always. And yeah, I think there are a lot of different things that people can do in general to reduce their risk of having those injuries. And that's everything from just mm -hmm. following solid training, like not going zero to a hundred. If you're mm -hmm. used to working out three days a week and you decide all of a sudden that, you know, you want to work out six days a week, that's a huge jump. You're seeing a double in the amount of training volume your body's used to. So maybe instead mm -hmm. of doing that, say, all right, I've been going three days a week. Next month, I'm going to go four days a week. A month after that, five days a week. A month after that, six days a week. Mm -hmm. Nobody signs up for a marathon that they're going to run the next day. You take yeah. months and months and months to prep and ramp up. The body doesn't like these rapid, huge changes in their training volume. So just be smart about your training volume. Think about mm -hmm. a variety of different lifestyle factors from there's a million studies on sleep and how much sleep is associated with people's risk of injury. So mm -hmm. if you're not getting seven or eight hours of sleep a night, your risk of injury is almost double what it is if you are getting eight hours of sleep. Um, mm -hmm. Nutrition is not talked about enough. Um, mm -hmm. You know, are you getting enough calories? Are you getting enough protein to recover from the work that you're asking your body to do? And then it's just following good training programming. But that's everybody talks about technique when it comes to injury prevention. And I really mm -hmm. think technique is a, is a huge component to that. But we mm -hmm. don't address the lifestyle stuff near enough and the training volume stuff near enough. Yeah. So I, I, I would assume that a lot of the people who do the, the zero to 100 are people who are former 
you know, who, who played sports in high school, maybe who would think yeah. of themselves, I think of thought, thought of themselves as athletes, maybe still think of themselves as athletes and then, and go into, you know, they find, uh, they find something like, um, sorry, I'm just going to throw this, uh, this business under the bus, but, um, Oh, what's the one that's like, it's just super intense. Um, and they have rowing and high intensity. And like, I think they have a heart monitor and everybody's monitor is up on the screen. It's a big chain, about, but I don't know what they are. I don't know oh, what they are. this is gonna, this is gonna kill me. Um, wow. I can't think uh, of what this is called. I'll give you a good example of this. That that's kind of common mm-hmm. runners. Like they're used to running three days a week for long distance. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden they start hearing, all right, I need to do cross training. And so then they jump into orange theory as the orange theory. And that's what I was oh, thinking. So, okay, of. It's orange theory. That's exactly uh, what I was thinking. I don't of. have a problem yeah. with orange theory overall. Yeah. Um, but like if you're a runner and your cross training is orange theory, where literally half of the workout is running most days of the week, then mm-hmm. that's not really cross training. That's you doing more of the same thing over and over. Mm. Got it. Yeah. Orange theory okay. Massive. Yeah. They're huge. And um, I, I know a lot of people get really addicted to the, um, the intensity of it. And, you know, then they, they three weeks in, they're like, ah, oh, I can't do a plank, you know, because their shoulders are garbage. Um, so anyways, that's, that's what I was thinking of. Um, but, uh, regarding that we can lead into uh, muscle strain. This is the big question that I have, or it's, I think there's a big misconception on what to do when you have a muscle strain. Cause yeah. everyone comes in, um, you know, I get, I get a lot of, you know, muscle strains from just people, you know, they're doing too much, um, and they push themselves too much and then they'll, they'll come in and it's like, yeah, I strained my hamstring. So I'm going to stretch it today. And I'm like, no, 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 stop, stop stretching it. Yeah. So, um, what should people be doing instead? It's just to find what a muscle strain is first or why it happens. It's mm-hmm. you ask that muscle to do a little bit more than it was prepared to do. And that mismatch between what it can do and what it was prepared to do led to it being overloaded and broken down a little bit more than it can recover from. And that's more than just like your typical muscle soreness. That's where it broke down enough that it became painful and isn't tolerating much load. Mm -hmm. So if the problem was that what you were asking it to do was more than where it currently was, and then it got injured. So there's an even bigger gap there. The answer isn't to stretch it because stretching isn't stretching has like minor impacts on muscle hypertrophy but like stretching doesn't make tissue stronger. Mm. And the issue in the first place was that tissue wasn't strong or fit enough to do what you were asking it to do. So instead, what we want to do with a muscle strain is progressively load it up, make Mm. it a stronger, fitter, more resilient tissue. Now, obviously you have to be smart about that because it's not like I strain my hamstring, Zach said, go get it stronger. I'm going to go max out my Romanian deadlift and go as heavy as I can with Mm -hmm. 10 out of 10 pain. It's more about being smart about that. Like, so um, one thing I really like in terms of loading muscles and tendons is it's called the silver nagle pain monitoring model. And that's kind of like a red light, yellow light, green light parameters for how much you're loading a tissue. If pain's greater than a five out of 10, that would be a red light. Like what you're asking it to do is too much based on its current irritability. And you're probably going to break that tissue down a little bit more, delay your healing process. A green light, something that's zero to two, like a little bit of minor discomfort with a muscle strain is 100% fine to exercise with. In between that, that yellow light of like a three or a four out of 10 discomfort, maybe a hair more than that is also okay. So long as your body recovers within 24 hours. So when I'm having somebody rehab a muscle strain, then I'm looking usually for like a yellow light on the thing that challenges that tissue so that we're putting a little load on it enough that we irritate it a little bit. And we're basically telling our body, hey, this area needs your attention. Send the hormones, the chemicals, all of that stuff there to help heal that up a little bit more. If we Mm -hmm. underdose that, like if it's completely pain-free, we're probably not going to challenge the body enough to to speed up that healing process as much as we like. And if we overload it, if we're doing exercises that are, you know, sixes and sevens out of 10, then we're probably Mm -hmm. just going to break it down a little bit more. Got it. So... You know, this, this actually leads me to another question that I had, is, but when these types of, let's say minor injuries or setbacks occur, things where it's like, you know, you didn't have this, this horrific bone break, but you wake up and you're like, okay, something's not feeling right. I don't think I can do my workout today. To what extent can people treat themselves using 
you know, using the proper information, whether they find it on like, for example, by the way, if you haven't seen Zach's Instagram yet, that's how I found Zach. His, um, geez, like every post is just, it's like a, it's like a blog and a single post. It is a, just a huge amount of information. Um, that's extremely helpful. So, you know, my kind of question is to what extent can people use info, like something that they'd see on, you know, your Instagram or maybe something that they would see on YouTube, um, versus needing individualized guidance. I I like to define this as like, is it a, most people know if they're dealing with a tweak or an injury, if it's a Mm. tweak, if it's the thing that like, when you're pushing your performance, you know, there are days where you wake up or you walk in the gym and you start doing stuff. You're like, that doesn't feel right. It's Mm -hmm. not injured. It's a little uncomfortable, but like, I know if I just am smart about today's training, I'll be fine next week. If it's a tweak, don't worry about it. Just modify, Mm -hmm. move around, make little adjustments, those sorts of things. When it's a little bit more than that, I do think a lot of people can self-treat, but Mm -hmm. that, that means, do you know what tissue is generating those symptoms? Like it's really easy most of the time to know if it's a hamstring strain. Like if you sit on the leg, leg curl machine, and you curl your leg in and that hurts, but you do a squat that doesn't really use squats, don't use your hamstrings that much. It doesn't hurt. And you can kind of self isolate. Okay. This feels like a hamstring strain. Mm -hmm. Now what we want to do is, are we tracking our symptoms regularly to make sure that it's progressing? If you know what tissues injured and you're seeing it regularly progress and you're tracking that, then continue doing that as long as you're happy with the speed at which it's recovering. But if you don't know what's injured or what area is generating your symptoms, or you're not seeing it regularly improve, or it's just at a stage where you know like, all right, I know this is my hamstring, but this thing is bad and I need somebody else's guidance and help to, to speed this up, mm-hmm. then go see somebody for assistance. Got it. If, for me, like if you're not sure what's happening and you know, you're, you're thinking, I mean, I'm thinking that if I have something happen to me and I don't know what it is, and I'm thinking about the value of me working out for two weeks or three weeks or however long it would take to, mm-hmm. to bounce back from that little tweak and how much it would cost to just go see like a qualified professional. I'm like, done. Let's go. Let's go find. Let's go find a good PT. Um, and I'm biased because, you know, my wife is a PT and I understand how much training they've gone through. Um, so I, I would rather. I would most of the time I would rather go see a PT than a chiropractor unless I feel like unless I can tell like, okay, my spine's out of whack, like it just feels off. And I think I need someone to like, you know, put it back into place. Um, But like for the most part, for me, like if I have an issue, I'm going to go I'm going to go find a PT. Um, And that actually brings me up to another point. So how hard is it to go see a PT? Because I know here in Texas, um, we don't have what's called direct access to yeah. PTs. We have to we have to go to a physician, and then they will refer us to a PT. Um, but I think in like forty six states or something like that, or forty four states, like you can. We're talking about the United States, by the way. So yeah. if you're not here, um, this might not be relevant. But is it easy to go see a physical therapist for the most part? Or all right, you're gonna open up a can of worms on this. You're gonna hear a little rant. Oh, God. First of all, in all general, right. usually in most states, it is generally easy to go see a physical therapist. Most states mm-hmm. now have recognized that for so many different injuries, going and seeing a physical therapist early on saves the entire medical system a lot of money. So your insurance pays less money, you pay less money, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So they've said, sure, let's like open up direct access and not have you have to go see your primary care who refers you to an orthopedist who then refers you to physical therapist. That's just skip. Right those two visits and x-rays and other imaging that might not be necessary for you. Yeah. And there are some States like Texas where direct access is not currently legal, um, which is a, a shame right now. Um, yeah. in Texas, you have to, like you said, go see a physician and get a referral despite all of that research. Um, the, mm-hmm. the Texas MD lobbying, uh, lobbyists have done a really good job of <laughs> producing yeah. some false information. Well, so from, from what I understand. So one of my, uh, one of my wife's colleagues, um, at her, clinic she used to work at is very familiar like this. And it's, it's, I think it's one doctor. It's like this one doctor who is in a certain position who like just shuts down the conversation every time it, it's, it, that there's, it comes up. So yeah, it's like, I've it's just one guy like, that like they have testified that like physical therapists only have to do like 20 hours of training. And that's what they said oh to gosh. their state Congress, which <laughs> the truth is that yes, they do 20 hours of continuing education on a yearly basis. 
after right. getting their degree, which is anywhere from a bachelor's degree to a doctorate degree, depending on when that person graduated from physical therapy school. Now it's mm-hmm. all doctorate degrees and then pass the licensure exam. And then they regularly do continuing education to maintain their licensure status. So it was like wow, that's a complete a BS presentation of what the truth is. Wow. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, if I had a Twitter, I would go yeah. send him some angry tweets, but um, I, I don't have Twitter. So, yeah, so what else have to do? like in my, um, I'm a partner in a series of clinics where we have 21 clinics around the country. And like the, one of the few States that's kind of off limits right now to us is Texas, because the way we operate and we market is we go direct to public. Like uh, I'm mm-hmm. in CrossFit gyms, doing workshops and talking to athletes about, you know, helping them out. And in Texas, you're kind of stuck in that whole loophole BS thing of direct access. Wow. That sucks. Yeah. So outside of Texas, is it easy to go see a physical therapist? Yeah. Um, I think there's only like three states now that don't have full direct access. Don't quote me on that number, but yeah, in general, okay. it's pretty easy. Got it. Um, so I think, uh, I think a cool question to ask you is, um, what, oh, kind of going based on what we were just talking about, um, what are some resources that people can use to kind of educate themselves to get kind of just a basic understanding of, oh, okay, this is what a hamstring, like just, just generalize fitness knowledge that can help them with easily identifiable issues. There's mm-hmm. certain books are there, you know, is there, should I just go ahead and say performance plus, um, or like, what are some things that can, can help with that? Um, in terms of understanding injuries. Yeah. In terms of understanding injuries or maybe just, just getting a more, getting a more general understanding of their body from a, from a consumer, from like a, a fitness consumer standpoint, not a fitness professional standpoint. To be honest, I don't have a great answer for you on that. Okay. Because uh, you know, what I consume is all meant for the fitness professional or healthcare professional, not right. as much the, the facing the patient. Right. Um, you educate, you train physical, I mean, you educate physical therapists, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I teach continued education courses to physical therapists. I mean, I've got hundreds of blogs on my website that, that kind of mm-hmm. is taking that to consumers. So the barbellphysio.com has that. I think one mm-hmm. of the best resources out there, um, the only other one I can really think of right now for your answer is um, CrossFit Journal. So for years, mm-hmm. CrossFit put out their own articles and they're kind of really well-written, easy ways. They, they have articles on anatomy. They have articles on lifting technique for different movements. They have articles on programming thousands of articles probably that's like mm-hmm. another fantastic research to, to check out it's not going to have you like reading you know scientific research articles where right. you go through the methods it's it's diluted for the masses yeah there's some books that i've got um that i purchased based on recommendations and i've gotten like three pages of it and i'm like nope yeah. this isn't gonna work and this isn't for me <laughs> so you gotta answer this for me now what, what would you recommend there what would i recommend did you have something in mind with that my, I mean, for me, it's, it's just been following, following my interest. It's like, if, I, if I'm interested in something or if somebody puts out some content that, you know, that I see that like, oh, this is helpful, then I'll go deeper into whatever, you know, whatever they're presenting or I'll do some, you know, I'll do some Google searches and I'll try to find, I'll try to find, you know, I'll try to find information from, from medical articles and, you know, I can't read the, I don't understand the, uh, the testing process, but I scroll down to the bottom and I look at the conclusion. I'm like, okay, well, this is what they're saying. So, you know, I kind of let my interest guide me. And I've also had, I've had like, you know, I've broken 12 bones. Uh, I've had wrist issues. I've had shoulder issues. I broke my collarbone. I had my knee surgery. I've had multiple sub, multiple partial subluxations in my knee. Um, I had a really bad high ankle sprain when I was a senior in college and playing lacrosse. Um, I've had random foot pain. Like I've, I've, I've had tons of different things and I've educated myself on those, um, through just, you know, my own personal interests. And as a result, I've learned about a lot of injuries. So like when people come to me and they're like, it hurts when I lift my arm overhead, I'm like, that's a rotator cuff issue. Let me tell you how, let me tell you what I know about that. And here are some exercises that you can do to work on that. Cause I've been through them. So for me, it's been just, you know, um, it's been years and years and years of, working out and just exploring, you know, things relevant to my own fitness goals. I guess I got one other answer now that I I heard you talk through that. Mm -hmm. If you go and you 
and you start researching a topic and you see mm -hmm. repeated names pop up in terms of research on an area, mm -hmm. go to your favorite podcast app and search for that researcher's name. Mm. And what you'll end up finding is them doing a podcast with somebody where they have really diluted the whole body of their research into, you know, a 15 to 45 minute podcast episode. So that'd be a great way to learn about stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. So um, if, if you wanted to know more about muscle hypertrophy and you went to the research, you're going to see Brad Schoenfeld's name everywhere in the hypertrophy research. Mm -hmm. He's been on 20 or 30 different podcasts where he talks for an hour on all the mechanism of hypertrophy and you can get all of that information done really quickly. What's his book? I just bought it. I bought his book within the last year. Oh, I'm pretty sure. Gosh. Um, I, my, my bookshelf moved. Place. It used to be, I used to be able to look at it and stay on the, uh, stay on the interview at the same time, but now I can't. Um, but I know he has a good book. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, so we talked about backtracking a little bit here, but we talked about working out through pain. How do you, you know, cause a lot of people hear that and they're like, Oh, well, I don't know. Um, I'm scared of working out through pain or they work out through pain. And they're like, you told me I could work out through pain and now it's worse. So like, how do you, um, you know, how do you kind of, how do you kind of tell if you're able to work out through pain and you know, what are some general guidelines for modification? So we first got to kind of determine what, what's the tissue. Like if it's a muscle or tendon injury, mm -hmm. then the silver nagel pain monitoring model thing we talked about earlier, the red light, mm -hmm. yellow light, green light is great metrics to know that you're exercising, you're challenging those tissues, but you're not overloading them. So long as mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of back to baseline in 24 hours. Um, but if we're talking about a stress fracture, for example, if that's your mm -hmm. injury that you're dealing with, with a stress fracture, we want absolutely zero pain while we exercise. And so that might mm. be one of the really rare exceptions where we have to really pull somebody's exercise level down a ton, because if we overload a stress fracture, we run the risk of turning that into a full fracture. And so mm -hmm. often, um, stress fractures happen in areas of the bone that have poor blood supply and, and the stress fracture can be a career ender. For, mm. for certain people. So we wouldn't want them exercising on that. Or, you know, if you have an arm fracture, you know, you, you fracture your wrist, even if it's like uncomfortable to bench press, we're probably not bench pressing. Mm -hmm. and it's a broken bone, but we could yeah. do other things to modify and train around it. Like we could put an ankle weight around your wrist and do at least like shoulder raises and stuff like that to try to maintain what level of fitness we can. So mm -hmm. I, I think that has to, we have to answer first what the tissue is to be gotcha. able to safely answer that. But most okay. people, most injuries are going to be muscle tendon injuries in the majority of injured people. And so the silver nagel pain monitoring model is just a, a great metric to follow there to give yourself a little bit of um, guide rails and what you can and can't do. Okay. Yeah, for me, um, I, I typically, if people ask me about that, I typically say, you know, go through it, see how it feels while you're doing it. But, um, but how do you feel to me like the day afterwards or like the following mm -hmm. days afterward? Those are really good indicators. Like right. if it's the day afterwards and you're like, okay, this is sore, but like it's not painful, then you're like, okay, that was good. And then, but if it's two days afterwards and you're like, okay, this hurts still, then, yeah. you know. I yeah, know. so find a marker like when we talk about, you know, tracking your symptoms. Let's say you're dealing with... Um, Let's say you're dealing with shoulder pain, like rotator cuff tendinopathy. Your rotator cuff's mm -hmm. pissed off at you. Reaching up in the cabinet to grab a coffee cup in the morning. If that's a two out of 10 today, mm -hmm. you do a heavy shoulder workout today and it bothers you a little bit during it, but you felt like it was fine to continue going during that workout. But tomorrow you go and reach up and the coffee mugs, you know, it's a four out of 10 to get it. So it's kind of doubled in that morning pain. That baseline is a lot higher. Then we mm -hmm. know, okay, what we did yesterday was too much. And next time I have a shoulder workout plan, I need to dial it back in intensity or volume or something or change the exercise a little bit. If mm -hmm. the reach up to the coffee mugs is two out of 10 today, two out of 10 tomorrow, so we're back to our baseline, we're good. Mm -hmm. We did an appropriate amount of volume, intensity, whatever, that our body could easily recover from back to where it was that, that first day. Hmm. How does your, you know, you haven't, we haven't talked about this at all yet. So I wanted to ask you about this, but how do you think um, self myofascial release works? Uh, figures into the recovery process? Is it, is it helpful to do, you know, like a vibrating foam roll or a foam roll or, or lacrosse so, ball or a tennis so ball? In general, most of the manual therapy things, whether you're getting a massage, myofascial mm -hmm. release, dry needling, spinal manipulation, none of those create permanent changes in tissues. Mm -hmm. so, so my metric for if something's really, really good or not in the long term 
-hmm. is would I actually use that to improve my fitness? So let's say you're trying to increase your bench press. Mm -hmm. Is getting myofascial release in your pecs going to make your pecs hypertrophy or get stronger to improve your bench press? No, Mm -hmm. it doesn't change those tissues in that way. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be the, the only thing that you need to do. But that stuff can have a good pain relieving effect that then Mm -hmm. allows you to do a better job of loading up those irritating tissues. Mm -hmm. They can create a localized pump and movement of fluids to reduce a little bit of that that inflammation that's keeping things more painful. So use it, Mm -hmm. but you need to use it in tandem with progressive loading. Cool. Yeah, I think that's an awesome description. It's like it's great to do if you use it with another modality, if you use it with something else. But if you just do it on its own, it, kind of like, you know, there's a lot of that's kind of like the that's a lot of the science behind stretching right now. Right. Is that it's good if it you know it can provide some t- temporary relief. Yeah. It does exactly. temporary stuff. But if that's all you're doing, then, you know, it's not going to do much. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's always, um, you know, we do this or that mm. we stretch or we strengthen or we do manual therapy or we don't do manual therapy. We only exercise. And the, the magic is truly like always in the middle on almost yeah. everything in life. It's in the middle. Like, so we're both in the United States. Mm-hmm. Our country will be really bad if we only had Republicans running it or we only had Democrats running it. There's something beautiful about the fact that we go back and forth every few years, Congress and the president shifts and somehow we still stay in the middle. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the way most things need to be. Yeah. And so that's a, That's, that leads a good, uh, that leads to a really good question. Um, but you know, a lot of, a lot of what I see and a lot of, um, I think some of the most easy to consume content that you'll see on social media when it comes to fitness information is the do this, not that, or here's right, here's wrong. And my question, not specifically with that, but with, with, you know, with, with social media and fitness in, in general is, uh, what do you think is missing from the majority of fitness influencers today? To make a big name in the online space. So often you have to have a loud voice that kind of disrupts the status quo. Like and I the think liver King. that's <laughs> liver King is the a perfect <laughs> example of that, but you, 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 make a big splash when you just take strictly contrarian views and Mm -hmm. you get a lot of followers. And that, that to me is kind of a red flag when somebody's only on social media, like just regularly bashing the things that other people are doing. Mm. That's a pretty red flag against, you know, wanting to follow somebody or believe in what they say. Mm -hmm. People are really dogmatic on certain things. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll give another example. Um, Like uh, Joel Seidman, if you're familiar with him, who's, talks about like, you know, it's only safe to squat to 90 degrees. And basically all of his exercises, he only takes the joints to a 90 degree angle versus going through full range of motion. And interesting, very opposite of what the research says, but like all of his posts are very much like, this is the way, this is the only way, this is how we do it. Yes. That's, that's, I mean, I don't think correct. People like it when it's painted in black and white. Right. And they, when they see that it gives them permission to think that way. I'm not just talking about fitness here but I won't get into other things. So there we go. Um, (laughs) Along those lines, how can you tell the difference between, you know, if you, if you do have people who you follow on social media and you're like, this guy's really cool. Or like, I like his content. How can you tell if somebody is qualified and they're putting out really good information, valid, valid information versus somebody who's doing something just gimmicky or trendy? It's the eyeball test. Um, There's not like a really good way to quantify it. I I wish there was like, we were mm-hmm. talking off air and I've tried to explain that like multiple yeah. times. I've tried to make a post where I say like, here are the things to look out for. But for mm-hmm. me, it's really the eyeball test. Like, is, does this just look weird? Are they only talking contrarian things? Are they only bought into one way of thinking and not willing to think outside of that? In which case, like they're not somebody that, that I think is worth following. Mm-hmm. So like kind of delving a little bit deeper into this, is it, is the complexity of the movement important? Is it, should we be focusing more on simple basic movements? Um, or, and that's, it's not a great, it's not as, I'm not asking a specific question there, but you know, in general, complexity general population. For sure. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like most I mean, of us, let's say 40 so plus. Page, and just... You will see tons of different variations because mm -hmm. I think having subtle variations on training patterns is great. The human body mm -hmm. loves variety. That doesn't mean like every week I'm training something different, but like there's value in doing, you know, a, a Romanian deadlift double leg stance, you know, for a period of time and then doing a Romanian deadlift with a split stance or a single leg Romanian deadlift. There's, there's that little subtle changes in variations. I think is positive, but when people are, always going nuts and they're always going crazy with you know bands hanging off or just super complex mm -hmm. stuff i don't think the majority of people need that they need to be training general movement patterns you know the squat the hinge overhead press horizontal press horizontal pull horizontal push in a variety of rep ranges in a variety of different energy systems and that's mm. pretty simple way to in general get fitter across all domains of fitness okay cool let's talk about rehab a little bit um, so what are, what are some of the psychological factors, uh, that get in the way of people recovering from injuries? And I'm asking this for you as a, you know, as a physical therapist, um, by the way, I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, um, we talked about this before, but you, you know, your day to day now you're, you're seeing, I think you said you treat 10 hours a week. Yeah. And you're, you're seeing people one-on-one yeah. -on -one and hour mm -hmm. sessions. Um, so you're not a, um, you're not a traditional physical therapist in that sense. Um, but you know, I'm assuming before you, you, you are where you are now, you were doing, you know, the, the traditional caseload. Yeah. So, you know, you were really involved in people one-on-one -on -one or maybe two-on-one, -on -one, I don't know, but, um, and charting their progress over, you know, eight weeks, 12 weeks, trying to get them to, and I'm saying this because I'm familiar with my wife, um, with my wife's practice and her goal was always like, let's get you better. Let's get you better. Let's get this pain down from a four out of 10 to a two out of 10. So I can discharge you because I got other people to see. And that's my goal. I want to get you pain free. So what gets in the way of people when it comes to being consistent with their rehab and recovering? So I treat primarily right now, CrossFitters, powerlifters, Olympic weightlifters. Mm. And for many of them, like that is either their favorite part of the day, or they associate themselves as I am a CrossFitter or I am a powerlifter. And it's like, mm -hmm. that is almost more important than what their job is. Mm. And when they can't do that because of an injury, psychologically, that can be really challenging at times to deal with. Like, I mm -hmm. want to be doing this. I can't be doing this. And if we can't find really good ways to modify and keep them doing something that feels like that thing that they love doing or they associate their life with, then mm -hmm. that can be really difficult for them to then want to stay consistently. They can get kind of stuck in a little cycle of feeling hopeless. They're hopeless, so they don't do the pieces that they need to do to get fully back to what they want to do. And so they just get stuck in not doing their home exercise program because they feel hopeless. But then that results in not being able to get back to the thing that they want to do. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. And that's yeah, where I, I think, think like, like you got to find somebody to work with that has a really good skill set at modifying what you're doing. They mm -hmm. can say, all right, we can't conventional deadlift right now because you've got a lot of nerve tension on board in your lower body, but we can sumo deadlift because when we spread your legs wider, that decreases nerve tension. And if you show up with this type of presentation, this exercise is typically much more tolerated by you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think people, when they're injured and they're, they're going through that, it almost feels like, um, feels like they're going to be stuck there forever. Like they're yeah. never going to get better. And it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to have kind of like an emotional understanding that things are going to get better. Like logically you might know like, Hey, like I'm here right now and this sucks, but I'm going to get better. But like emotionally yeah. you're stuck in this, man, this sucks. And I don't think it's going to get better. And, uh, you know, um, especially if like you're saying they're associating that with their identity, it's tough. There. So, um, I think, so something that's kind of fascinating to me is, is, um, is pain and I'm not an expert on pain, but from what I've learned about pain, pain is, um, pain is often, um, pain is often kind of like an idea. Like you, you have a, you have a familiar experience or a previous experience with when I do this with my body, this causes pain. And so when you do it again, there might not actually be the physical component there mm -hmm. that's causing the pain, but mentally you're like, there is pain. I'm experiencing it. Yes. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? 
And I, I think it's a pretty yeah. complex topic. So uh, it, it, it is. So feel free to collect yourself. <laughs> we tissues heal, but a mm-hmm. lot of times in some individuals dealing with more chronic pain, the tissues might heal or, or maybe they don't heal, but the nervous system does not recover or hyper responds the opposite direction. So our, our body's nervous system is really complex. And mm. so think of it like this, like I've, I've treated a number of people in the past with what's called hyperalgesia. So they have a hyperactive response to stimulus. So let's say it's back pain. Mm-hmm. They're laying on their stomach and I'm evaluating their back and I touch their skin like lighter than you would touch a button on your remote control to your TV. And mm-hmm. they associate that as painful mm. when you barely touch them. Was that amount of pressure enough that we damage any tissue anymore? No. So we didn't like, you know, if I'd slam them with a, you know, a hundred pound sledgehammer, is that enough that it could have caused more damage? Yes. But touching them wasn't. So that is an example of somebody whose nervous system is so ramped up and overprotective of an area that non-damaging stimuli become painful. And that is a, a whole different ballpark in terms of treating people's pain. I don't treat a whole lot of chronic pain right now. Like my job mm-hmm. is to, to inoculate people against becoming chronic pain patients. Mm-hmm. Um, but for those people, so often the, the rehab interventions that they're still doing is focused solely on the tissue and not on the nervous system. Mm-hmm. Um, so people that have chronic pain or um, maladaptive pain is what, is what it's probably more commonly called now you can have them do some crazy tests where they look at pictures of somebody's right hand versus left hand. Let's say they have like a right shoulder injury. That's now like maladaptive and their nervous system overprotective. You can show them pictures of a right hand versus left hand. And you have them say, Oh, that's right. That's left. That's right. That's left. And they actually, their brain won't be able to as accurately identify which side it is when it's that painful side. Like Mm -hmm. they just get all these insane nervous system changes. And so, if you're in that situation, you have to find somebody that not only addresses the underlying tissues that might still have some damage to them, but that is also skilled at helping you understand how to resolve those nervous system components to it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking of the mirror thing and I'm thinking of setting up like you set up a mirror. So basically you can put your right arm in front of it and then you move it. Yeah. But your brain is like, that's my left arm. And then you feel pain in your right. You feel pain in your left shoulder. If you have pain there, if you have that maladaptive um, injury, well, I forgot what you said, but um, yeah, it's fascinating that like your brain's like, oh, that's hurting. And your body's like, no, 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 we're not even moving that. Yeah. It just looks but like it. Phantom limb syndrome is, is a great example of this where like people's hand will hurt. Like let's say you would cut your arm off below the elbow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Amputees will say that their hand hurts on that side and they don't yeah. actually have a hand anymore. So how yeah. does their hand hurt? It's crazy. It's the nervous system is, is, is insane. So. What are some nervous system treatments if we're going beyond the tissue? What are some things that you can do when you, you, you continue to have that pain? So with those individuals, you have to, number one, focus a lot on function. Like you've been dealing with this amount of pain for forever. Well, let's just figure out ways to at least get you doing more of the things that you love while mm-hmm. still having this amount of pain. Like if you're always, let's say worst case scenario, you're always going to have this pain. Well, would you rather always have this pain sitting in your house all day long? Or would you have that, rather have that pain when you're going out and you're watching your grandkids soccer game and mm-hmm. you're going shopping in the mall, like whatever it is you love, like let's figure out how to focus on function. We got to look at a lot of lifestyle factors where we're down-regulating the overall nervous system, getting on a more anti-inflammatory diet, figuring out ways to move and exercise, improving your sleep quality, those sorts of things. And then if we go to actually like training the nervous system, there's, there's tons of different things. Like the tests we talked about where you're looking at pictures, just working mm-hmm. through things like that can help with the nervous system as well. That's um, one of my, my friends and colleagues named Justin Dunaway is like one of the leading experts in the world on this type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Or you can look at um, books by Adrian Lowe. I think that's spelled L-O-U-W. Okay. He, he has some books on, on why you hurt. Or there's a guy named Greg Lehman who has a free workbook out on his website. Lehman spelled L-E-H-M-A-N. Those guys are much more into that than I am. I'm staying like big picture because I don't, I don't honestly treat that very often. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's so, but it's, that's it's, so interesting. It's weird. It's it so is weird. It is weird. Um, wow. So um, I want to switch gears a little bit because I'm, I'm really intrigued about you and I want to ask you questions about you. And I, okay. I honestly don't know how much you, I don't know how much you, you do this, like talk about yourself and in, in your content or maybe you do and I missed it. Um, but I think 
something that people, um, you know, something that's apparent just looking at, you know, all the different things that you do. First off, you're a content machine. Like you crank out a ton of content. You put a ton of effort into your content. And, you know, I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you have the energy to create that much content, balancing, running all these clinics, treating people on your own? Where's that, where does that desire to create content come from? The desire to create content is, I honestly believe that if you're doing things different and you have something to share with the world, then it's kind of your moral obligation to try to push things to the next level. Mm -hmm. So I, whether I was making money on my online content or not, I, I think I'm doing things differently that I think is changing the, the profession of physical therapy in the right way. So whether I made money doing that or not, I'd be sharing it because I just, I believe it's my moral obligation. So then how do I get it all done? I'm really good at batching. So like on my desk right now, I've just got a, like a list of things that I need to film. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, we just moved to a new house. I built out the garage to be my filming studio. So like my camera is set up on the tripod right now. I literally walk in, I press a button on the phone, all my lights turn on, turn my camera on, and I'm ready to go to film. And I'll just film all of that at once. That is amazing. Unfortunately, now I have a video editor. So I just then send him the videos and he takes care of that. And I've done that for so long and I've done so many live presentations that it is rare that I have to shoot something more than twice. 90% mm -hmm. of the time I get it done the first take less than 2% of the time. Do I have to do like three takes of something? So that just makes it happen a lot faster, which makes it quite a bit easier. But in general, like I'm just had to get really good, especially since my kid was born at like looking at my schedule and blocking out periods of time for a very specific task and knowing that, Hey, during these two hours, this is, this is what I'm doing to make sure I get yeah. it done. But I, yeah. some people don't feel this way, but like, dude, I live on stress. Like, <laughs> if I didn't have a whole lot to do, I would be so bored in life. I, I actually like, I dread retirement. Retirement. I hear that. Awful. I, uh, yeah. Whenever I'm like sitting down and I'm relaxing, my, my mind is like, dude, why aren't you stressed? Like, go find something to go find something to do. Go find some work to do. There's some work to do. There's something, go do something. <laughs> and I have to like force myself to no, 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 just sit here and enjoy your house. Enjoy your family. Yeah. Enjoy this mundane tasks that you're doing. And that's like, yeah, that's a, that's a struggle for me. I'm with um, you. I have to constantly remind myself like to stop and like block in my head. Like at this time I'm done working and my focus is on this. Yeah. Or, like I, I even just try to make myself enjoy like mundane tasks, like folding towels. I, I try to look at it as like, how pristine can I do this? So, like I get in the zone yeah. and focus on this and like turn little things like that into like my form of meditation. Yeah. I, I'm when I'm doing that, I try to thinking about the towel. Yeah. Like when I'm doing something like that, I try to, I try to, I try to, like you said, I try to like enjoy the task or like make it like, how can I do this well? But I also, when I'm doing things like that, my tendency is to like rush through it. Like it's a to-do list. And I have to stop and remind myself, like, you are not be, you are not being chased by like a freaking tiger right now. Or like, this is not like a life or death situation. You need to chill the F out. You're just, you know, you're just folding a towel like this laundry will get done yeah. in five minutes. If you rush, maybe three minutes, but like that two minutes is not going to make a difference. And the added stress that you're putting on yourself, folding laundry, like, yeah. no, not worth it. Um, <laughs> there. Yeah. So like something else that I've, uh, so with content creation and I'm just focusing on this cause this is kind of, this is, this is what I know. I'm a bit, I'm a big content creator. And, um, I had, a I I had Drew Lynch on the podcast earlier. He's a, he's a well-known American comedian. He was on America's got talent in 2015, got in second place. And I, I talked about this with him about content creation and how it kind of helps you. It kind of helps. I don't know if you identify as a content creator or not, but like for me, it kind of helps me with making sense of things in my head. Like it's like, it's a form of, um, it helps me kind of process things that I'm thinking of. And once I get it, then I'm like, okay, that, that conundrum is solved. Like that's out of my head now and I can move on to something else. So I'm, you know, I'm curious for you, like, how do you find, uh, do you find that content creation helps you mentally or do you, you know, how do you see it? Long form content does like sitting out and trying to write a blog to explain something really helps me. Like I'll sit on a long form, like article for a while at times. Mm -hmm where I really try to hash out like the specific details of why that might be happening, the pros and cons of something and mm -hmm. problem solving. 
Got it. So when there's a when there's a lot of when it's in depth, when there's a lot of when there's a lot of thinking that goes into it, then it's something that when you do when you go through that, then that's like okay, that that helps me out. But like yeah. if you're just making like a like a two minute video or something like that off the cuff, like that's not. Yeah, if I'm making a reel, I'd say in general, usually that's not stuff that's like yeah. making me thick. Yeah. Most of the time when I tell people, when people ask me like, where should I go to learn more about you? I say, go to the website where you can get like an in-depth analysis of something, not Instagram where you see like a 15 second snippet video of one exercise and why I use that one exercise. You're better off to go to the article where I dissect everything on that exercise, mm. why I use it, the clinical reasoning behind it, those sorts of things. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just being a proponent of your Instagram here because it's so good. But like, I remember seeing, uh, I think the first piece of content that I saw with you, you were going through a, um, you were going through how to lift your arm overhead without pain. And I was like, oh, there'll be like three exercises here. And you had like 10 phases. You had like 10 different progressions. I'm like, holy crap, this is really intense. This is like, this is a lot of content. Um, but anyways. Um, so the other I'm, thing that really helps me out with that is, is taking students physical mm. therapy students that, that come and work at my clinic, um, forcing me to slow down and, and say, why did I choose this exercise over this? They both have the same goal of strengthening the same tissue, but like with a, let's say an upper hamstring strain, why did I choose to do that with the hip flexed or extended mm. and breaking that out? helps me out quite a bit. So now I'm kind of curious, where does this, where does this way, where does this approach to your work come from? Like, is, have you always been like this? Did you develop it out of necessity? Was your dad like this? Or like, where does this method of, you know, your, your work methodology, where does it come from? Uh, so my dad always told me just to, to not look for what the world needs. I forget who said this quote. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So what, what am I decision-making processes on anything I do is, am I going to be excited to do this on a daily basis? Yeah. If so, let's do it. If not, it's not worth my time right now. I'm not worth my energy. It's going to suck a lot more out of that. So I want to choose things that, that I'm super excited to work on because then it makes it very easy to crank away at it. Do you find that you have to go back every few months and like reassess things? And if they're no longer exciting, do you absolve yourself of them somehow or do you do you only take things that you're excited on and, and like and you and you're pretty good about not overloading yourself at this point i'm really good at not taking things that i don't want to be doing um okay. but i'm just where i'm at like financially across my businesses that makes it really easy so there have certainly been times in the past where i didn't have that luxury so like right now i don't take new patients mm -hmm. but if you call the clinic up and I'm talking to you on the phone about like what you're dealing with in Europe, CrossFitter that's dealing with like hip impingement. And I'm like, okay, I'd be excited to treat this person. Mm -hmm. Then I might bring them in. But if it's somebody like that just sprained their ankle yesterday, they want to get back to playing soccer. I have somebody on my team that's number one, better at that. Number two, more excited to treat that than I am. So mm -hmm. that, that makes it a little bit fortunate. More so now, like my, my focus isn't on like, because I'm already only doing the stuff I love. It's what's the stuff that I love doing but that's not the best use of my time. Like I actually enjoy editing my videos. Mm -hmm. I like being the person that does that work, um, but I don't have the time for it anymore. So I had to outsource that. Yeah. And there'll be more little things like that, you know, as the business can, businesses continue to evolve. Was it difficult for you to start letting, letting go of control of things as they got, you yeah. know, as they got bigger? Yes. Yes. It still is. Yeah. What was, what's, what, what's the, what's the hard part of that? I think it's hard to communicate your vision to people sometimes. Yes. And that usually <laughs> comes down to you not setting the right expectations from the start. Yeah. We, we assume that everybody else has our same drive and desire, our same vision to do things mm -hmm. a certain way. And more times than not, when I've failed on some delegation and I look mm -hmm. back on it, it is my problem. I have to take ownership of the fact that I didn't set down the right expectation to give people the right guidance. Yeah. I, I'm always shocked when people can't read my mind. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, why isn't this clear? And then, you know, there's follow-up questions. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, and, you know, I've been working with the team for, I don't know, however many years now. But, you know, it's like, I still, uh, I guess almost, almost eight years now. But, like, I still have this issue where, 
you know, someone comes back with something and I'm like, whoa, 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 what, <laughs> what wasn't clear? And then, you know, we go back like, oh, I didn't give you any sort of like expectations on. So uh, that's a hard pill to swallow to sit back and say, that was my fault. Yeah. I like, didn't I, do the right thing to set you up for success. And uh, I'll be the first to tell you that I was not very good at that. Even a year ago, I mm-hmm. still know I need to get better at that. But now when people fail, I try to force myself to, to have the first question I ask is it, why did you do it that way? It's what did I not do that mm-hmm. led to you doing it that way? Yeah. Yeah. That's tough to do. Um, it's tough to be unselfish like that and, you know, put the blame on yourself. Um, what are some ways that, you know, and I'm just, I'm kind of just asking these questions based on a lot of the the themes that we've explored on this, the Better Man podcast. And I think a, one of the big themes that we explore is I think men don't take care of themselves enough. And so I'm kind of curious, like, what are, that sounds like some one way that you're, you know, in a way not being selfish. I think ultimately when you reflect on it, it is selfish. It is within your best, is best interest to like put the blame on yourself and to, have a better relationship with your team members, but what are some things that you do for yourself selfishly to, you know, just take care, take care of yourself? I think the biggest thing for me is exercise. I need that hour long exercise on a daily basis. So I have Mm -hmm. to be really good at staying ahead of my schedule. And when a day starts to get really full, I got to stop and block my hour. That is non-negotiable that I will be exercising for that hour and I will not Mm -hmm. change it, delete it for almost anything. Um, sort of family issues. Mm-hmm. The second thing is I have to give myself permission to work hard and work a lot of hours so mm-hmm. that I don't feel bad when I'm not doing that and can then focus on family stuff. But yeah. I, I think you can be selfless during times of the day or times of your week so that you can be selfless at other times. Is that something that you, so it's, it's you, your wife, you have a almost one year old. Yep. When's his, when's his birthday? May 24th. Okay. Cool. So is that a conversation that you, you had to have with your wife at some point? Like, Hey, like business is getting bigger. I need this hour to myself. Like, how did you go about having that conversation? My wife and I had a lot of conversations prior to getting married or engaged around a number of different things, just because, um, you know, divorce rates are so high, um, that we Mm -hmm. made sure prior to getting married that we were on the exact same page financially. We also had mm-hmm. a lot of conversations about where we wanted to go career-wise. My wife's an amazing pharmacist, very highly trained um, tr- to do certain things in the pharmacy world. And you know, prior to us getting married, I said, look, this is what I want to do. Like, my goal is to change the way that physical therapy is done. That's going to require me being more than a clinician at a local clinic. Mm-hmm. What do you want to do with your career? My wife said that she wanted to be a great clinician for the people in front of her. And so we kind of knew from the start that we have different goals that we're not both trying to do things that are going to conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just as different things have grown, we've been fortunate that like she can work a little less hours that gives her a little bit more downtime, lets her do a few more things around the house, mm-hmm. do a I mean, communication in the marriage is always up and down, but we do mm-hmm. a decent job of regularly talking and making sure we're both doing what we need to do for the other people. And obviously there's always times where you don't do that for the other person or they don't do it for you, but mm-hmm. we touch base on that enough that at least the ship's always heading in general in the right direction. It just needs to be turned back 10 or 15 degrees. Yeah. What, what are, so that, what that's are a lot of conversations after, you know, multiple rounds of couples counseling too. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge proponent of couples counseling. I talk about it a lot. Um, yeah. I had a, I did a solo podcast a few weeks ago when I talked about couples counseling as, and how it was so helpful, um, just to being able to facilitate the framework for having a conversation. You know, I think most people, you know, I can only say about myself, but I think the default for, for relationships when they have conversations is to, this is my point. This is why you're wrong. And then it's the same person from the other person. And then you're just back and forth without anyone ever feeling heard. And there's no like sort of resolution. Um, and it's, yeah, that's not the way to do it. So, um, I'll also what are the first some person to tell you in my marriage that like, I'm not in charge of the house. My wife's in charge of the house. So mm-hmm. like, next weekend I'm traveling to teach a course. Mm-hmm. And so I'm being selfish and going out and doing the thing that I really love. Even, even though it's business it's work, mm-hmm. I love doing it. So yeah. this coming weekend I'm doing whatever she wants to do. I am not mm-hmm. making plans to go out and do anything. I'm going to exercise on Saturday. But other than that, whatever my wife wants to do, I'm doing all weekend long because that is my time to 
be focused on her. Mm -hmm. Do you have, um, do you have regular bro time? Like regular uh, time where you hang out with other guys? Not that much. So not I, that yeah, much? Yeah. I, I consider my best friends are all my work friends. Yeah. Okay. So it's group so you interact with. That I teach with. So yeah, but like we're spread out all over the country. Yeah. While I do occasionally like hang out with local friends. I'm, I feel much more connected to them because it's with the, the entrepreneur drive that I have and how much I'm mm -hmm. doing business wise, I sometimes don't feel relatable to people that don't have that amount of drive. Mm. And I don't, I don't mean that negatively against them at all. In fact, many times I'm jealous of people that just want to work eight to five. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough to. I, I travel a ton too. So that mm -hmm. also makes it even harder. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Is that something that, do you feel like that is something that long-term you would like to improve or like, is that something that like you feel, does it feel like you're getting enough? the way that you're doing things now? I wouldn't mind a few more hours in the day on a daily basis, but I'm pretty happy with how everything is right now in my life. And I feel, I feel very balanced. Cool. All right. Sweet. Um, kind of along those lines, um, you know, you became a dad a year ago. Um, what's the biggest change uh, in your fitness and maybe more broadly in your life and your work life uh, when it comes to, to you being a dad now? Work life, the biggest change overall is just a few less hours in the day. Like when I'm used to getting up every day at, at 5 a.m. and starting work at 6 a.m., now there are a couple of days a week where you know I'm in charge of Keegan in the morning and I have to be mm -hmm. the one that gets him to daycare. And so that, that cuts a little bit of time out there. Um, other than missing out on you know a handful of hours on a weekly basis and missing home a little bit more when I'm on the road traveling and teaching courses, um, I think the biggest change for me from a fitness perspective is just not that I'm working out less. It's just that I have to be more forgiving of myself of knowing when I come in and, you know, I should be able to hit this weight for this many reps mm -hmm. and it doesn't happen that day because I had to get up last night in the middle of the night to give him a bottle and I didn't sleep as well, or he was coughing all night long and woke me up five times in the baby monitor. I just have to be more forgiving of myself and understand that like my recovery is not where it should be. My performance isn't going to be as great as it could be right now. And, that has been super tough as well. Just to be honest about that, like it's, mm -hmm. that's, I was a month ago, just so ticked off when I retested my maxes and I'm like, why can I not do this? That was 40 pounds less than I benched two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I just had a great training cycle, but I missed a weight that I should have been able to crush. And then I'd say, Oh, this week, Keegan's been sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Slept well all week long. And yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. That's tough when you realize that you're, you're not doing, uh, you're not as strong as you thought you would be. And it's, yeah, I mean, the sleep factor, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm laughing. I was laughing at the the coughing on the monitor thing because as soon as I hear a cough on the monitor, I'm like, great, I know he's coughing. We're going to turn this off now. And m my wife doesn't really have a say in it because she's asleep anyways. But I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm awake through that coughing. So um, I just, I walk over and I turn it off and then we go upstairs in the morning and there our child is still alive and well. Um, you know, she worries more than I do for, you know, probably good reason, but <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to, let's get into our rapid fire questions. And I've, I've already kind of asked a few similar of these types of questions just based on where the conversation went. But I have these a uh, few questions that I, I have a few questions that I ask just uh, to everybody on this, uh, uh, on the show. So um, you, are you ready? Yep. Cool. What do you think is one habit, belief, or mindset that has helped you the most in terms of your overall happiness? I would believe it'd be that quote that, that I said earlier that my dad talked about. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Hmm. Yeah. That's it. What is, I got to ask, are you, you, is your dad's, is your dad still alive? Dad's still alive. Dad's still alive. High school football coach for 30 years. Okay. You guys talk a lot? A lot. Yeah. That's awesome. Happy for you guys. What's one thing that you do for your health that you believe is overlooked or undervalued by others? Tracking caloric intake. Chopping? Uh, tracking, sorry. Tracking. I thought you said so chopping. Tracking my, my total calories. I don't believe that you have to specifically track your calories, but you need, if you're worried about your nutrition and optimizing your performance, you have to be measuring what you're intaking in some way, form or fashion. And I, I'm always shocked when I stopped tracking for a period of time and realize how far off I've gotten over where I should be. 
more or less for you? Less protein than I should be. Like a, mm. it's very common for me to stop tracking and get 120 grams of protein on a daily mm -hmm. basis when I should be getting um, somewhere between 160 and 200 on a daily basis. What's the easiest way for you to add in that missed protein? Uh, for me, the easiest way to add in is end of the day, what I haven't gotten in Greek yogurt with a scoop of protein powder in it. It just makes Greek yogurt taste really good and super easy to get down. Okay, cool. Great tip. What's the most important activity you regularly do for your stress management? Exercise. Exercise. Okay. What's the most stressful part of your day-to-day -day life? Managing other human beings is for sure <laughs> a stressful component of my life. Uh, trying to convey your beliefs and expectations to other people. Yeah. I was just thinking of your, you know, all the different things you have going on, but it sounds like you have compartmentalized everything so well that you're able to, do you do, have you heard of a work shutdown process? Is this something you're familiar with? No. So this is a concept by Cal Newport, but basically by the end of the, before the end of the workday, you wrap up all the things you do and you kind of just leave a note like where you left off and then you mm -hmm. kind of shut the book and then you're like, okay, okay. I know where everything's done. Is it? Is that something that you do or a similar thing to that? Or how do you try to? I've got this glass marker board sitting underneath my computer monitor. The nice. things in white are the big projects that are ongoing. The things in yellow are the things that I want to get done that day or that week. And so okay. yeah, it's pretty much that. Awesome. It's a great system. Uh, last question. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing men and their well-being right now? Not being vulnerable with their spouse and telling them the truth. Mm. Yeah. It's a good uh it's a good one. I think the I think the not being vulnerable in general is the big theme that uh that I like exploring. And then the uh with your spouse. I think it's shocking how how not close so many men are with their with their with their partners. Like you think like, oh, we talk a lot, but you're like, well, you're kind of just doing you're just planning things. You're not actually talking and sharing your feelings or just sitting down at the end of the day and say like, Hey, how are you feeling right now? Like what's going on? And it's just like those short little, those short little bids, I'll call them that lead into having like these really, that can lead into having these like really simple conversations, but like so effective for just like feeling better in your marriage. Right. So cool. All right. Well, I think, uh, that was an awesome podcast. We got through so much. That was amazing. Yeah. Um, we got through a ton of questions and then we got through all of like my, all of my uh, all of my non fitness questions um, uh, going into you, uh, your relationship, um, your beliefs, your habits. That was awesome. So uh, I want to thank you for your time. Um, thank you really for good. your incredibly concise answers that allowed us to like have so much information. So um, this was a this is a really good episode. What's the best way for people to keep up with you to to learn more about what you do and to, and to help uh, help their bodies? thebarbellphysio.com is my website. Uh, my other website where we also put out a lot of content is performancepluspprogramming.com and same username on Instagram is our main platform in terms of social media. Okay. How does the, uh, can you really, like 30 seconds, can you briefly explain the performance plus programming, like how that works? Yes. Yeah, so um, what, my business partner there, her name is Pamela Gagnon. So Pamela Gagnon is just super well known in the CrossFit gymnastics space. And, and so she understands gymnastics. I understand programming for strength and programming for mobility. And so for people that have any goals in that spectrum, a lot of times they're already following solid programming. So say you're a CrossFitter, you're going to your gym on a daily basis, you're getting in your daily dose of fitness, but you have little aspects of your fitness that need extra attention. Your hip mobility stinks or you're, you've got a good, strong, strict chest to bar pull up, but you haven't figured out how to turn that into a muscle up. We have accessory programs that are just quick 10 to 15 minute workouts that you do at the end of your workout to help kind of bridge that gap between the big fitness stuff you're doing in your daily programming and your next goals that you want to hit. That's awesome. That's like, that's so helpful. Yeah. Like breaking it down like that and then short, like 10 minute stuff that you can just throw in. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, I'm gonna have to link for that. Is there, we didn't talk about this before, is there any sort of uh, promo code or some sort of freebie that we can mention to people who listen to this podcast that we can get people in to get them going on that? We have a ton of free resources. I don't even know what the link is. Like we've got a number of like free programs um, that give you an example of what we do. If people send me a DM, 
like we have a grip program, we have um, a gymnastics based core program and a couple others. So if they send me a DM on Instagram, I can send them links to example programs like that to check out. Perfect. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in for the better man podcast. Zach, that was amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you. Yeah. All right, guys. I'll see you guys on the next episode. Hope this inspires you to be a better man. If you like that episode, check out this other one right here. I think you're really going to enjoy it. If you haven't subscribed, click this subscribe button over here, and you can listen to the full episodes on any major podcasting platform. Full details below in the description.